And what a great weekend we had together and walking through Holy Week and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, everything we did was so meaningful and really brought this story to life. And we heard the resurrection story read by Nicole and that was found in John. I'm going to read the account from Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and clothing white as snow. And for the fear of him, the guards trembled, and they became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. Let's just take a moment and enter into that story. Let's use our imaginations. I want you to picture what that must have been like to be those two Marys, and let's just be their companions at the tomb, coming to see what happened to Jesus. So just, we join the two Marys. They're standing at the tomb. And it's just before dawn. So those of you who are at, the, at our cola at 6 a.m., it was dark and cold. And it was just before dawn. But then imagine the subtle pink of the sky as the sun rises in the east. And the sound of cicadas that was this insect where, where they lived, and it had this shrill, droning sound to this voice. So the cicadas were going, the sun was rising, and then the first birds began to sing. Looking at our two companions, the two Marys, notice their puffy eyes. They've been crying all night. They've had a terrible sleep, probably no sleep at all, just wondering what happened. What was that this weekend? How could this take place? And worrying. Look at the two Roman guards. They're foreboding. Make us a little bit nervous standing there. But the garden, it is so beautiful, even in the half light. The trees, the scent of the flowers on the dew of the new morning. Just picture that, smell that in the quiet. And suddenly there is this rumble, this thunder. It's an earthquake. Everything starts to shake. Mary shrieks. The soldiers, they curse, and this dazzling light appears. The last time that happened was when Jesus was born. The angels filled the sky with the shepherds. This dazzling light and squinting in terror at its brightness. There's this shadow of a man or a woman in that light, inside of it. And he or she is pushing that massive boulder that just can't be moved, and they're pushing it with their sheer strength aside while the go- the guards are laying motionless on the ground maybe unconscious but or probably just pretending to be dead and then the angel it ho- he hops he or she hops onto the rock and there's this light dancing inside the tomb and then the angel looks over at all of us and at the two marys and says in the loudest whisper do not be afraid. Again, the last time we read about that, it was Mary getting news she was pregnant with Jesus. And the angel said, do not be afraid. You have found favor with the Lord. And we know what finding favor means. Your whole life is about to change. And then, having said, do not be afraid, the angels, they give a second command. And they say, go quickly and tell. Tell the disciples. Well, tell what? 
We don't know what just happened. There's like, this is just this crazy weekend. And it was horrific and terrible and traumatic. And then Jesus died and he's in the tomb. We just came to check on his body and make sure everything was as it should be. We, what were you supposed to tell them? We don't know. Where'd he go? Could it be that he did rise just as he said? That he was no longer dead? But, but if that's true, well, what does that mean? What are we supposed to do with that? Well, we're going to explore that over the next four weeks together. We have come to the end of our Cultivating Shalom series, and we're moving next week into a series called Practice Resurrection. And it's an an ordinary life with extraordinary power because we are resurrection people. And we forget maybe sometimes that we have that same power and that we are called and invited to live resurrection lives. And so hopefully the next four weeks will help us understand how we're to live in light of the resurrection, how Christ's rising from the dead, conquering death, shapes and forms us. But for right now, let's just take a a look one more time at shalom. Shalom was the term used in the Old Testament, and then we move into the New Testament, and that word for that kind of peace turns to ereni. I can't say it very well. But it's it's, it's the same kind of peace, but with a different context. So shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. It is this rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied, natural gifts fruitfully employed, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens the door and welcomes his creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. We know that. We've got it memorized, right? And now things are shifting in light of the resurrection. Let's watch the video. In the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. 
The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Irene, I wish I could say it better. So that wholeness, that completeness, that complete restoration, Jesus did that. Through his death on the cross and his resurrection, Jesus fixed what was broken. Shalom is fixing what is broken, restoring it to wholeness. Jesus did that between humanity and God. And in Romans 5, verse 1 to 9, Paul talks about this. He says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace, Irene, with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Jesus reconciled the world to himself. He restored us to wholeness. And this peace, this shalom to Irene peace, is not like the peace in Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything. It's this peace with God where our sins have been forgiven, our slates have been wiped clean. We are in a position of being right with God. Now, some of us were going, I didn't know anything was wrong. And that's the thing. We are unaware of how bad things actually are. But Jesus reconciled with God, uh, us with God. He won. And this peace can only come through Jesus Christ. And the Bible doesn't say we have peace with the devil or we have peace with ourselves or peace with sin or peace with the world. It's peace with God. Complete restoration. Complete wholeness. And because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We have been given his grace. We no longer have to earn this. It's completely undeserved. And we can rejoice in that. <clears throat> and we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials because we know they help us develop endurance, resilience. Because even though Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, the world is still broken. But the thing is, he has fixed it. One day we know all will be redeemed and restored, but in the meantime, he's working with us, his people, to bring this restoration, that we are to become people of peace. John 14, 27 says, Jesus is our peace. And, he, and Jesus said to his disciples, I give you peace. I give you my peace. It is ours. We can experience it here and now. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were useless, while we were ungodly. He didn't wait for us to have it all together, to be perfect human beings. It's not possible in this life. He came at just the right time. And the work of the cross was the ultimate proof of God's love for us. Everything was driven by love. His deep, deep, unrelenting love. And now we are completely reconciled to God. 
And now he invites us into his way. He paid it all. He fixed it all. We stand in a position, even though we're still wrestling with temptation and sin and all that, we can come to him and give it, and ask, give it to him and ask him for forgiveness. And we are forgiven because Christ himself is our peace. And when he said to his disciples before he died, Jesus says, peace, my peace I give you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And there it is again. Do not be afraid. My peace I give you. And he is inviting us to become people of peace and to bring that peace into the world. What does that look like? Well, we need to practice. And so we're going to practice being resurrection people. We are going to follow the disciples and all the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. And he appeared to this person and that person in the most unlikely places and in the most unlikely way and in the most ordinary situations. And we're going to follow the disciples. We're going to look at their reactions and their response to this risen Christ and try and, and we'll wrestle with them as they're trying to figure out what do we do with this resurrected Messiah and how does that impact us and how does our life need to change in light of the resurrection. And so I look forward to this next four weeks to see how do we practice resurrection. Can I pray a blessing over you this Easter Sunday? May this Easter day bring resurrection life to our hearts and our homes. May renewal radiate within us and revival emanate through us. May dawn re displace the darkness and spring replace the winter in our lives. May the God of hope so fill us with joy and peace this Easter that we may overflow with hope by the power of his life forever. Amen. Amen and thank you.